So, yeah. Excuse me, sorry. Uh, what I mean is this accelerated application oh, okay. of standards based approach. You know, there's the point that I'm not sure who mentioned it earlier, but I'd like, you know, if you pick the standard in haste, you can like, have a problem at your peril a couple of years down the road, you know? So just in the context of that rapid deployment, rapid, you have to solve the problem, okay? What is the what are the benefits of doing it that quick way? What are the risks of doing it that quick way? Well, the risks are easier to understand, I think, and 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 state. I, I don't I, I don't know if I understand the question from a benefits perspective, but um, I think uh, Siobhan alluded to it. If it, the, the risk of doing benefits or uh, standards at speed is that you can only you can only take a certain amount. You've only got a certain amount of bandwidth. You know, we knocked our meetings down from an hour to half an hour so that we could get more meetings into the day, right? So that's the pressure we were working under. And and then it kind of comes back to the education piece, I think, you know, from your point of view, that if you've got experienced people in the room when you do that design who bring, like yourself, an enormous amount of knowledge to the table, you can really go very quickly because you're not making an argument for using a standard. Um, you can really go very quickly through all of, all of the things you need to do because you're nodding at, in Siobhan's case, you're nodding at the expert and you're saying, you know, does that comply? And, it, and they take responsibility for that piece. The disadvantage is that if you, if, you, if you don't have that team on the ground and you're trying to grapple with the standard as well as implement it, as well as get to the next meeting and do a different standard in the next meeting, then inevitably you take this kind of organic approach where you say um, there was this concept of um, minimum viable spec. So we got the minimum viable spec each iteration. And so inevitably over time, you know, what you started with was not as much data or as good quality data as it was when you were a little bit further down the track. So there the risk is that, you know, you've you kind of lost way with the data and you haven't quite got everything that you wanted and i think that's often the tussle it's the tussle with the standards people and it's also the tussle with the patient because there has to be a sort of an <coughs> um a maturity to understanding what it was you were trying to do at the time and what resources and what the context you were doing it in so that if you know if somebody's data doesn't come out exactly the right way up it's um it's forgiven rather than it being the benchmark for the whole system, you know, when you look at somebody who comes out of the system at the other end of the development. Can I just say as well, I think one of the things that I picked up from the conversation is that you weren't dealing with sort of unknowns to some extent because you were with mature standards yeah. already established. Yes, okay. one is well established and health is well established. And people again include, you know, instinctively know by his domain expertise whether that would fly or work. So yeah, I, think, yeah. I think the experience of the team obviously had a big part to play and the fact that you were using mature standards. Yeah, and I, I think on that point as well, I think a lot of, I suppose, we just saw a lot of the dots joining up. So the link between COVAX, uh, the national vaccine system for, for the record, and TrackVax was actually the, the health identifier, the, the global location number, which is a GS1 number. So that was actually the, the common link that allowed the, the systems to, to share information on the vaccine. So we definitely saw the joining of the dots, the, the proven standards in use. And also there was, there was because of the system actually grew organically, there was kind of a natural feedback loop because we had all the right people around the table, all the right stakeholders. So if it, if it hadn't been done with COVID, it would have, I don't think we'd have got anything better. In fact, I, don't, I think it probably would have been worse because we wouldn't have had this, that speed of acceleration and design and you know, the system always worked. You know, it grew and we I suppose, added resources as needed and also had an agility in the spec design that worked with the users to make sure it was always fit for purpose. And we have to say, like, it, we're still using the standards. It's a standards approach. Like, it's not an ad hoc approach. You know, so this has been tried and tested. And you're still dealing with consensus-based, you know, um, development. So you're, it's not just that. So it's a very difficult question to answer because benefits are built into standardization. Like, you know, by default, if you're using standardization, there will be inherent be be benefits, you know, in terms of impact, in terms of quality. You know, so they're they're already built in because you use the standard. In an ad hoc approach, if if, if you're trying to identify benefits because it was ad hoc, then it might make more. No, uh, I wasn't suggesting that it was ad hoc. That's what you're getting there. I'm just thinking that you know, there's an interesting case study there where standards implementation happened really quickly. Yeah. You know, so what what is good about that? You know, and I mean, 
everything. <laughs> everything, yeah, absolutely. But everything, like, yeah. Then to what extent can that be scaled and be applied in a case where like the whole national interest was focused on this this topic? You know, that, that's an, that's a, a really interesting debate. And that's a whole separate question because like you're looking at you know, open standards, how they're developed. You know, your de jure de facto standards are completely different um, uh, mechanisms for, for, for being created, but you're using it industry-based standard standards at the national level, at the regional level, and at, at the global level. The pace is completely different. Like whether you're dealing with uh, organizations and associations or whether you're dealing with national bodies, you know, there's because that means you have to go through a whole consultative process. So there are completely different processes in place. And the this faster is, is the standards adoption, would that be fair to say, rather than standards creation. Is that fair? But like you're implementing yeah. using yeah. standards. So, yes. yeah. okay. I've got one more thing to say to you, Damon. I think the thing that Derek said was very interesting about the fear factor. And I think what you're looking at is fear inverted with risk, because essentially the, co the cost of not doing that mm -hmm. in the accelerated way that you did it far outweighed the fear of doing it and maybe not getting it completely right, if you know what I'm saying. In a, you know one percent wrong maybe and i think that was yeah the fear was was quite high i mean it was a huge impetus wasn't it so that might be another piece i think i think it may it may be easier to compare um standards that were used as covax developed with standards that weren't used um and i don't know Eamon probably could speak to that better than i could but you know there were there were other standards that could have been used, but if you didn't have an expert on the ground in the, in, at the day, on the day, the voice wasn't even in the room. And, you know, arguably there wouldn't have been space for more voices in the room anyway. It was hard enough. Um, but it, it, might, it might be an easier comparison. 